Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Jack Douglas. And this is the 17-foot outboard christened The Searcher, which took part in one of the most daring sea voyages of the past year, the first circumnavigation of the Baja California Peninsula in a small boat of this size, a journey, incidentally, of some 2,500 miles. And here's the two-man crew of The Searcher, men who literally risked their lives in accomplishing this incredible feat. Milt Farney of Santa Ana, California, and Larry Foglino of Temple City, California. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, the voyage of the searcher. This is True Television. Jack Douglas presents Across the Seven Seas, your television tour of the world we live in. Now, ladies and gentlemen, here at his home in Santa Ana, California, to describe and show us the actual films of this adventurous voyage is the young man who conceived the idea of circumnavigating the Baja Peninsula, Mr. Milt Farney. As a native Californian, I've always been intrigued by Baja and the idea of taking a small outboard clear around this rugged peninsula. It was an idea that just sort of grew over the years. I kept wanting to do it and putting it off until finally I ran out of reasons why I shouldn't do it. I talked about the idea with my buddy, Larry Foglino. He said he'd be free for a few months, so we shook hands on it, bought the 17-footer, and before we knew it, we were on our way. Well, this is a big day. After all of our weeks of planning and preparation, we're finally ready to launch and christen the searcher. We invited a few of our friends who live in the Los Angeles area to help out with launching and christening. Now, I don't suppose the fact that we mentioned that we had a couple of extra bottles of champagne left over had anything to do with their staying. Well, they did, and we were glad to have them. Many, many good wishes later, we we're ready for a shakedown cruise. Now, gas is going to be one of our major problems along the barren Baja California coast, but we've prepared for this thanks to my good friend, Bob Gibhart, who agreed to fly down the coast in his airplane and make contact with us at various prearranged spots. And in the event that we can't secure enough gasoline, he will supply us with aerial gas drops, such as we're demonstrating here. This will give you an idea of the large amount of supplies necessary for a voyage of this type. You may wonder where we're going to put it all. Well, believe me, we wondered too for a while. But we did manage to get it all in. And finally, the day arrived for our departure. Again, we had a few friends and some of the family to see us off and wish us good luck on our journey. It was a beautiful day as we left Newport Beach, California and headed down the California coastline for our first stop at the port of San Diego, which is near the Mexican border. We spent our first night in San Diego Harbor and the following day we were in Mexican waters. Our first stop was the port town of Ensenada, some 70 miles below the border. This will give you a bird's eye view of the harbor and breakwater at Ensenada. Like any vessel, regardless of size, we had to check in at the broker's office where we received our clearance papers and Mexican port permits. At the broker's here, we heard of an interesting sidelight in Ensenada, one that we decided we must investigate. You've probably heard of Devere Baker and the famous Lehigh rafts that made so many ill-fated attempts to drift from the California mainland to the Hawaiian Islands. Well, Lehigh, too, was abandoned off the California coast after the Coast Guard had rescued the crew members. It was left to drift in the ocean, and several months later, it drifted into Mexican waters just offshore from Ensenada. A couple of local fishermen went out, tied onto it, and towed it into port, hoping to make a tourist attraction out of it. But their venture didn't pay off, so they dismantled the raft for the use of the lumber. And all that remains today is a cabin section resting in a vacant lot on the outskirts of town. This was of particular interest to my partner, Larry. For you see, he was the first mate and navigator on Lehigh 5, which finally completed a successful voyage from the California mainland to Hawaii. The whole coastline is dotted with grim reminders of what can happen to the unlucky voyager caught in the sudden storms in these waters. The squalls are called chabascos. Here's a clever way the Mexican fishermen have of storing their small dories or fishing boats when not in use. 
They drag them up high on the beach and encase them in mounds of sand. This not only prevents the dories from being blown away in violent storms, but they told us that the damp sand helps retain the shape of the boat and keeps the wood from drying out or splitting. We stopped in many little villages and ports along the way. The natives were always very friendly and very curious as to what we were doing. They turned out in large numbers to welcome us or wish us goodbye. And you know, I think they found it hard to believe that these two gringles were actually trying to circumnavigate Baja California in such a tiny boat. At times, we went for days without seeing a living thing, except for possibly a creature of the sea, or once in a while, a large bird perched in his nest high on the cliffs. But we enjoyed these days of leisure and relaxation, just catching up on our sleep and soaking in a little sunshine and enjoying the beauties of the rugged coast. It was always a thrill when Bob would catch up with us and give us an unexpected buzz job, and sometimes making contact via our two-way radio we would learn that there was a beach ahead where he could land and meet us. And in some cases like this, he dropped us some cold drinks, which were very much appreciated. A little while later, Bob had landed and joined us for a few hours of relaxation and fishing. The fishing wasn't so good, so Bob fell fast asleep. We thought this would be a good joke, to cast him loose, and wouldn't he be surprised when he woke up and found himself drifting aimlessly out in the middle of the ocean in a rubber raft. But as often happens, jokes backfire. After casting him loose, a couple of large whales appeared a half mile away. Now, I don't think these whales would harm us or meant any harm to Bob, but just the sight of these huge mammals so close by when you're in a small boat is enough to scare you out of your skin. We revved up and Bob was a mighty happy hitchhiker when we hove to. That same afternoon, a large shark kept making passes at the searcher, trying for some of the fish that we had tied over the side. So I grabbed a harpoon, and with a lucky first shot, I got him right below the dorsal fin. I turned the line over to Bob so I could take a few films. For a while, it looked like the shark was going to win, and then it looked like it might be a draw. And finally, Larry, being experienced from his Lehigh days, got into the act. He just reached down in the water and grabbed the shark by his tail and proceeded to pull it aboard. This particular stretch of the coast has more than a share of sharks. The very next morning, while fishing off the beach, another large shark kept making passes at my line and stealing my bait. Finally, he succeeded in taking the whole hook, line, sinker, and all. This time, Larry played the part of the harpooner. This one didn't offer much of a struggle, just a slow, steady pull. It was also a hammerhead, incidentally. Getting him ashore and up onto the beach, we discovered the remains of my broken off fishing line still in his mouth, which proved to us that this was the one that had been stealing the bait. We had quite an argument as to which shark was the biggest, but to be perfectly honest, I must admit that Larry's was about a foot longer than mine, but that's not what I told him. Now here was one of the eerie highlights of the whole voyage, whales that had apparently committed suicide. At least this is a story that the natives tell us. This happens at this particular section of the coast every few years. These whales swim ashore in the shallow water as if bound to destroy themselves. The fishermen told us that they had even hooked onto their tails with ropes while some of the whales were still alive and tried towing them back out into deeper water. But immediately upon turning them loose, they swam back to shore where they eventually died at low tide. There must be a reason for this strange behavior, but whatever it was, we couldn't find out. A little farther along, on a particularly fine stretch of the beach, Bob landed and picked us up, and we went out for a little aerial survey trip. And here was a colorful sight, a tremendous herd of seals, roughly two or three hundred, more than I had ever seen at any one time. Earlier on the voyage at Ensenada, some yachtsmen had told us about catching baby seals and what wonderful pets they made. They claimed that the seals were very easy to tame, and if caught at a young age, they were easy to train. Well, we decided that we would give it a try. Sneaking down behind these sand dunes, Larry prepares for action and charges the herd expecting to grab a young seal. But apparently, the seals didn't know how to play this game because Larry never got closer than 20 yards. And here's a sight no sailor ever tires of. Schools of graceful, leaping porpoise. Porpoise by the hundreds. The legend of the sea has it 
that it's bad luck to kill a porpoise, and superstitions of the sea are not to be taken lightly, especially among fishermen. Now, almost at the halfway point of our voyage, we made another contact with Bob via the two-way radio. We learned there was a cove just ahead where he could make a landing. So anchoring the searcher offshore, we arrive at the beach just in time to see Bob digging in for the night. And sitting around that cozy campfire, the tall tails grew taller and taller and taller. We were now nearing the halfway point of our voyage. And by this time, we felt that our multitude of daily problems would be behind us once we rounded the Cape and reached the Gulf of California, which separates Baja from the mainland of Mexico. But in plain fact, the most hazardous and most dangerous part of our voyage was still ahead, as we'll see in just a few moments. Having been weathered in for several days at Magdalena Bay, we were now facing our longest stretch of open water without harbor or shelter of any kind, some 180 miles of coastline before rounding the Cape and the shelter of the Gulf of California. Anxious to get the stretch behind us, we decided to make a night run. Larry is catching up on a few last minute notes in his log, and I give my cameras a quick once over. And here's Larry preparing his pearliest smile for the senoritas at Cape San Lucas. Taking the necessary precautions, we pump the little life raft up with air and fix it to the back of the searcher. Here Larry is putting a police whistle around his neck. We found early in the voyage that our yells could not be heard above the noise of the wind and the motors. So we got these police whistles and wear them as an extra precaution in case one of us should fall overboard. You know, for all the trouble I went to cleaning my camera, I might just as well have saved my time. We got one shot of the twin motors and takeoff. Then Larry got a shot of me, and I took one of him sprawled in the bow, peering out into the darkness, and that was it. Because by 1 a.m., the sea began to boil like nothing I'd ever seen, and we had all we could do to stay afloat, let alone worry about taking film. By daylight, we were still in choppy water, some five miles from the Cape. But then, once around these rocks, the sea was as smooth as a glass tabletop. For these are the last rock formations at the southernmost point of Baja, separating the Pacific from the Gulf of California. And you know, although we hadn't been at all seasick during the wild sea of the night before, I'll have to admit that the sudden change of smooth sailing made Larry and me feel a little queasy. Rounding the Cape, we pulled into the beach just off San Lucas and dropped our anchor to catch up on some much needed sleep. The following morning, we continued our voyage northward up the Gulf, and our first stop is at the little fishing camp of Las Cruces. We're anxious to go ashore here, for it was at this spot that Hernando Cortez made his first landing in Baja, California, a mere 34 years after Columbus discovered America. Landing here, his band of explorers encountered some of the local natives, and in the skirmish, several of Cortez's men were killed. So they erected three wooden crosses in honor of their dead comrades, and in later years, these have been replaced by three stone crosses to commemorate the landing of Cortez in Baja, California. The next stop on our journey northward is the port town of La Paz. La Paz is the largest town in the southern part of Baja. Upon pulling up to the dock here, we were greeted by quite a large crowd. We found out later that this was due to the grapevine rumors that we had been reported lost at sea. The official greeter of La Paz, Mr. Bill Escudera, was on hand and they immediately whisked us uptown along the Palm Line waterfront and we checked in at one of the local hotels. Because of the advanced publicity, erroneous though it was, we found ourselves local celebrities. The local radio station was on hand to interview us and talk about our experiences. We bragged a little, but not too much. 
Well, we spruced up a bit to do the town. Larry trims his beard, and I trim my mustache, which certainly needed it after our weeks at sea. And where did we end up? Of all places, at the local ice cream parlor for a banana split and a shoe shine. It's funny, of all the things you think you'd miss on a voyage of this kind, the thing we really missed the most was ice cream, especially in the form of banana splits. We spent several wonderful days at La Paz, just soaking up the sun and playing it up like tourists. And here's a typical gorgeous La Paz sunset. Leaving La Paz now and heading northward again, our next stop is at a little town called Mulahay. Here we're entering the mouth of the river, which empties into the gulf. And a few miles inland, the river leads us to the town of Mulahay itself. We immediately found ourselves on a sandbar. The river is very narrow and the water shallow. We hadn't been warned about this, but with a great deal of pulling on Larry's part and pushing on my part, we finally had the searcher back afloat. Mulahay is truly the garden spot of the peninsula. With its lazy river, thick green foliage, and date palms, it really has a South Seas atmosphere. Back aboard the searcher, Larry is using his harpoon to take depth soundings, picking out a deeper channel. As usually happens, the grapevine had preceded us, and when we arrived at the upper portion of the river, we find Mr. Octavio Salazar and his wife on hand to greet us. Mr. and Mrs. Salazar are the owners and operators of the Club Mulahe, which is well known to many North American sportsmen. As if by planning, we arrived in Mulahe just in time for one of Salazar's famous Mexican lunches. And after lunch, we took a tour of town. Mulahe is a beautiful, quiet little town nestled between two mountains in a deep valley. It's typically Mexican and has a small adobe church, a little dusty lane leading down to the river. And here we see one of the muchachos doing his daily chores of bringing fresh water to his home. This might be called a Mulahe door-to-door -door salesman. He sells chickens. Mulahe is famous for its fishing, and we decided to try our luck. So accompanied by Salazar and his right-hand man, we boarded the searcher and headed down the coast to Conception Bay. Conception Bay is 28 miles long and only three miles wide, and is sometimes called the fish trap of the Gulf. This could very well be true. There is just about every variety that you could think of here. Pargos, whitefish, blackfish, sea bass, sierras, grupa, dolphin, roosterfish, you name it, it's here. Salazar turned out to be the hero of the day. He caught the largest fish of the entire trip. It was a black sea bass and put up quite a struggle. With everybody on board taking turns helping, we finally got him aboard. Getting back to the club and weighing out our prize, it turned out to be well over 100 pounds. You know, there's one nice thing about fishing here at Mulahay. Not only do you have the sport of fishing, but none of your catch goes to waste. They have a very nice custom of taking only what the club needs and turning the rest over to the townspeople who welcome the free fish. This little old lady here was so happy at having been given two fish that all she could do was keep turning around and saying, muchas gracias, senor, muchas gracias. The next morning, we were faced with near tragedy. The searcher had swamped during the night. At first glance, we thought this would be the end of our voyage. Apparently, what had happened was that the stern line had come loose and the searcher had blown sideways and got caught under the heavy brush that grows along the river. The following morning, when the tide came in, the brush was holding down the stern of the searcher and didn't allow her to rise with the tide. So consequently, the water poured in over the rear transom and flooded our cockpit and forward cabin. Luckily, most of our cameras and film were up in the Club Mulahay at the time. One of our large gas tanks was half filled with salt water, which necessitated cleaning it out before reuse. 
Most of the equipment that got soaked was our emergency rations, extra parts of the motors, and bedding. As for mechanical troubles, we were quite fortunate. Only the electrical system was badly damaged, which meant that we would not be able to use our starters or generators for the rest of the trip. It just meant a little extra effort for Larry and me to start the motors by hand. Well, all good things have to come to an end. So after a couple of weeks fishing and enjoying the scenery in Mulahe, it's finally time to head northward for the last lap of our voyage. Here the Salazars are presenting us with a couple of hats off the walls of the Club Mulahe, with promises that they'd bring good luck for the balance of our voyage. We really hated to say goodbye to our two friends here and their lovely oasis. But continuing on northward, our next stop is at the famous fishing camp of Bahia, Los Angeles, very well known to American sportsmen who are lucky enough to own their own airplanes. There are many little bays and islands off the shores here. The water is crystal clear and abounds with fish, a real skin diver's paradise. One of the major means of livelihood hereabouts is turtle fishing. And here we see several of the natives trying to get their catch aboard the dugout. These are the large sea turtle variety, and they go upwards of 100 to 150 pounds. They have a clever way of keeping the turtles alive here in Bahia until they can be shipped to the restaurants and marketplaces in the north. In the background, you will see turtle sheds, which are built close to the water. In a high tide, the water floods into the turtle shed, giving the turtles a somewhat natural environment. Our next stop is in San Filippi. Not just another port, but the last port and the end of our sea voyage. We pulled the searcher out of the water and hooked her up for the land journey home. It was a sad day and a happy day. We were sad to leave behind the many wonderful people who had treated us so graciously and the memorable days and weeks that we had spent exploring. But I'll have to admit that we were happy to be returning home after our long absence. We had accomplished what had never been done before. We had circumnavigated the Baja Peninsula in a small outboard, some 2,500 miles of open water in 85 days. By contrast, the journey home took only seven hours by car, cutting diagonally across the California border to Newport Beach, thus ending the voyage of the searcher. A lot of our friends have asked me what was the real highlight of the voyage, and I guess most of them expect me to say the highlight came about when we completed the circumnavigation. But actually, I think the real highlight was discovering the oasis at Mulahe. I know I've already mentioned how beautiful it is, but it's the kind of place that you really have to see for yourself in order to believe it. I've enjoyed showing you these films of our voyage, and now, back to the studio. Here's Jack. Next week, a most unusual voyage is in store for us when we join Mr. Clifford Kamen to search for and find the seven splendors of Persia. We sincerely hope you'll be with us. Until then, with thanks again to Mr. Milt Farney and Mr. Larry Foglino for a fascinating sea voyage, this is Jack Douglas saying thank you so much and good night, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Thank you.